Right, so yesterday I showed you insulating the roof. We've cut out for the lights. Uh, we left a 100 mil void around there. We've pushed our insulation tight to the top and explained why we did that yesterday. Again, we've insulated the walls. The insulation is pushed back tight to the walls. Now, the best way to do this and the most economical way that we've found, that we've found is um, cavity battens. They're 450 by 1200. It's a, bit, it's a lot easier to work with these than it is with a 1200 by... 2.4 sheet of 50 mil. 50 mil is more than enough in the wall. So what we do, we cut it down that way. You can put it in, in a full piece like that if you wanted, but then you're gonna left with this crappy little off cut that you're gonna struggle to get rid of. If you put them in like that and cut them, you get two bits in a cut. Down at the bottom there, we put two full bits, which is 900, so all them noggins are 900 high. So what we did, we've obviously put two, two cavity bats cut on side, the noggin's gone in on top of there, and then we've infilled the rest. So that's the easiest way to do. Cut it on its side rather than that, because you'll be left with a crappy little off cut. Also, we're looking for continuity in the insulation in the wall. So you've got your wall going up there, you've got your roof there, but you've also got this gap here. Um, that goes out into the back soffit there as well. So what we're going to do with that, we've cut this insulation, which is 22 mil. Jen's cut it rather, and what we're going to do then is force that into that hole, tap it in with a bit of slate lap. And then that will then give you continuity of insulation up your wall, top of the wall plate, and then onto the roof, which is what you're looking for. On another note, what we've also put in is patrasses. Now a patras basically is a piece of wood behind the plasterboard which will allow you to fix anything to... So here there's a heater going there. What we've used is some of this 18mm OSB free roofing boards which has been left over. Um, Jen's cut them to size. I've drove them in. I've kept them flush there. Now it's important that you keep them flush because if you don't keep them flush, let me tell you what will happen. So. You'll put that in, it'll be stacked behind plasterboard a couple of mil, you'll screw your plasterboard to that, and then you'll get it plastered. Job looks okay, doesn't it? But then what you're gonna do then, you're gonna put your bracket on for your heater, and when you put that bracket on that wall there, and it meets that resistance there and that resistance there, what it will do then, it will pull the patras forward, and then any plasterboard screws that you've got going through there will then pop off the plaster. So with that in mind, your patrasses need to be flush with the timber. So them two there will carry the heater, that's where the fuse spur's going. Over here, he's having a TV on a bracket on the wall. His desk is going to be over there, so his TV on a folding bracket will flip out like that. He'll be able to sit there and see that. Up here is where the consumer unit is going. So again, we need a patras there as well. What we'll do as well, Adam will measure across there. He'll take a photograph of that tape measure on that wall. So when he puts the consumer unit on the wall, the knockout in the back of the consumer unit, he doesn't want to land there because that means he's drilling through that full timber to get outside. So he'll reference off that photograph that he's taken and he'll decide where his consumer unit's going. Again, they're flush, they're flush, all nice and flush. So when them brackets go on, they don't pull the plasterboard screws forward. So that's it, we've got a little bit more insulation to do. Um, over here, you obviously you can't get your 100 past your upside down joist hanger. So what we'll do then, we'll go to the outside. I don't know if you can see my fingers, just look up there, Jen. Can you see my fingers there, yeah? Right, so what we'll do then, we'll fill that with rock wool so that you've still got full insulation over the full building. So that's it, that's your insulation. What we'll do, we'll finish these little bits now. We'll get it cleared out and then we're gonna put a vapor barrier on and I'll show you the easiest way to fix your vapor barrier as well. Right, so Liam wants me to go through a bit more electricals with you all because you've been asking for it. So I've done the lights, I explained them yesterday what we're doing with the lights. Um, if we come out here where our light switch is going I'm going to, when we've plasterboarded it, I'm going to drill out and I'll know where, where to feed our cables in. I've run a feed from here to where our consumer unit's going, through the joist, all the way across and left my wire ready to come in for when we put plasterboards on, consumer unit on and I'll drill out and bring all my cables through there. Um, that's it for lighting really. We, we are going to throw some canopy lights in the front which is just a, a daisy chain between, between these. We'll, we'll measure it out and just put them equidistant. Um, Why have you not put your back boxes in yet? Because there's no plasterboard to put them in yet. Right, but some people use metal back boxes, don't they? Well, I have wired this building, it doesn't look like I have yet, for power. The reason being, because it's not been plasterboarded yet, when we've plasterboarded it, I know where the sockets are going. I've drawn myself a diagram and I've, I know where they are. Like a schematic? Like a schematic. Um, 
and I'll know where, where my sockets are going. And I've already run the wires externally, which if Liam has a look, you'll see it. My cables are all there. You'll see the loops sticking out there. So when we've boarded it today, I'll go around and measure. I, I, we don't go off the regs with our, with our socket height. It, we just go for aesthetics, really. What, why, Adam? What, tell us why. Because there's, there's no need for them to be 450 up in, halfway up the wall. We're, this isn't a disabled building. Equal. It's, it's not a disabled building. It's a fully functioning building. <laughs> e equally with but the. We don't discriminate the way Adam. No, does. equally with the light switch, I just put it at a, a height that I think's suitable. Um, yeah, so I've I've also run the power for the the heater, which is going on this wall underneath the window. There's um, a few spur going behind there. So when like, equally when we've when we've plasterboarded it again, we'll determine where the heat is going and put our, our single back box on. So can you tell me, have you run radials or rings? They're, they're all radials, so it's just a daisy chain. The consumer unit's going on that wall. It goes down from that consumer unit to the first socket, out of that socket into the next one, out of that one into the next one, and so on and so forth, till you come to the last one, which, as it happens, has fallen nicely on the outside socket which is there, so that's the last one on the radial. And it'll just come out of the wall when we clad it, we'll just pop a little hole out, put our outside socket on there, and that's it. So that's a radial? That's what the... size breaker will you be running that radial off, Adam? That'll be on a 16 amp breaker. And what size breaker will the... So they'll, bo they'll be both be on a 16 amp breaker. And what size your li your breaker lights will be on a six. Your inside lights and your canopy lights will be on the same one on a six amp breaker. Your security light will be on its own, just straight to the to the board with a six amp breaker. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I mean, it seems really really simple to me, but I'm sure that people will learn. So, so there you go. <laughs> no bull, straightforward talking electrician, isn't it, Adam? Yep. Easy as peas. So what Adam's doing now is trimming back his cables for his lights, just so that we can get them up into the ceiling and not in the way when we come to plasterboard it. What we'll do now, um, we'll wait till this foam's gone off, it's still a bit soft there. Um, and then we'll just pick it off to make sure it's not hanging down past the rafters. And then we'll apply our vapour barrier. But it's breakfast time now, isn't it, Adam? Yes. Right, so that's the room insulated. What we're going to do now, we're going to put on a vapour barrier. Um, this particular vapour barrier, I think, um, is 4 metres by 25 metres, which is big enough to span the roof in one piece. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to roll it out on the floor. Make sure it's longer than the room. <coughs> so what I'm going to do, I'm going to cut it, cut it so it's actually longer than the room. Um, I'm then going to use this DeWalt stapler. It's firing 10mm staples. Um, this is what I've found is the easiest way is to do it on your own and you can get a tighter, a tighter application as it were. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to unwrap it a little bit. Then I'm going to start in the corner. I'm going to let it hang down the wall a little bit because I know that we, well, we should be longer than the room and wider than the room as well. So what I'll do, because um, we, we want to overlap it. So basically, I'm just going to go along the back wall, fixing it to the rafters. Um, the one at Tool Station, I believe off the top of my head is green and you can't see through it, but this one's from Selco's. It's obviously clear, which aids fixing because you can see where your joists are and it's not a problem. So the back wall is fully fixed on there. What I'm gonna do now, I'm just gonna walk slowly into the room, keeping the tension on it and just stapling it as I go along. Just pushing it up with my hand to get to the front of the room there. So that's down one joist. What I'll do then now, I'll skip a joist. Again. Just keeping the tension on with my hand. Just to keep, try and keep it relatively tight up onto the roof. That's two. We'll get that one over there in that corner. Again, now because you're going at the corner, you can just pull it a little bit tighter. The vapour barrier, um, I know some of you don't use it, some of you swear by it, some of you get a better quality one, um, but what hopefully I'll do, 
I'll show you once he's skimmed it just how good a basic vapor barrier is at stopping moisture entering the walls and the roof. Once he's plastered, I'll be able to show you that hopefully if I remember. So that's his sealing up. Um, what I'll do now, I'll just go along and just fire a few more staples in it. And then we're good. I'm happy with that. Again, because it's clear, you can see through it, which will aid you when you're doing your plaster boards. It's a bit of a pain, is the green one, because you can't actually see through it. You can see it's hanging down the walls there as well. Hanging down the walls there and hanging down the walls at the front. What I will do, I will then do the walls, overlap them, so that there's a complete vapour barrier from there down. So the vapour barrier runs along the ceiling, down the walls, and there you go. That'll be that. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to staple that down there. I'll trim it off around the window, and then we should be good to go on the walls and then we'll get some plaster boards up soon as Adam arrives he's just nipped back off to um, take delivery of doors and windows on another job that we're doing um, if you know if you've ordered doors and windows you'll know I've run out of staples no you won't know that you'll know that um, there's a massive delay on them on doors and windows um, on, on a lot of materials it's starting to come now wood prices have gone through the roof which is slightly annoying because I've obviously priced for jobs for the rest of the year um, and the initial quotation will sort of slightly go out the window for me but I'll have to honour what I've priced just the way of the world um, so that's that the roof vapour barrier completely on what I'll do now I'll go and trim off around the doors um, just so that we can see and get in a bit better and then I'm going to do the same again I'll roll it out on the floor make sure it's longer than the walls and then um, I'll fix it to the walls and then we'll be good for plasterboarding so that's your roof done it's fairly tight I'm happy enough with that it's not a problem we'll overlap it up on the walls um, if, yeah don't, I mean one minute Jen just come over here and I'll show you it's not the end of the world, and if you're putting it up in two pieces, again, it's not the end of the world. I mean, it depends what, how far you want to go with it and how anal you want to go with it, but trust me, when that plasterboard's up there, if you've got a joint in there, the vapour hasn't got a mind of its own. It doesn't go, oh, look, a gap there, let me sneak through there. It doesn't happen like that. Once you cut them lights out there, you're going to have holes in it anyway. You're going to stop 90% of it. 90% is good enough in the room like this. What you've got to remember is these are generally low occupancy rooms, which means there's not a lot of people in all of the time. Not like your house where you've got five, six people in a modern townhouse. You've got two bathrooms. You've got a working kitchen. All that moisture is building up in that house, and it's going to go somewhere. It's not the same scenario in here. You're just probably reading too much into it. So we're going to do the wall now. Um, like I said, it's four metres, so I'm just going to... What we're doing, because it will want to pull off its own weight sometimes, so we're just doubling it up on the top there, just to hold it better with staple. It's not going to affect your plasterboard when you put your plasterboard on. We're talking microns rather than millimetres. Um, yeah, just watch your fingers. So... What we'll do, we'll do. Yeah, that, so what Jen's doing now, she's just pulling it down. Um, again, if you haven't got it tight, it's not the end of the world. You're still creating that vapour barrier. And these DeWalt staplers are actually spot on. I think they're about 35 quid. I know you're thinking, oh, it keeps adding to my bill cost. You know, and it does, but you've got to look at time saver as well. And end of the day, if you're only going to build one of these in your lifetime, Get it all sold when you build them, when you've built it. Or move out and build yourself another one, because that's what most people end up doing. Once you've built one once, they're like an addiction. What right, Jen? Yeah. Run. Ooh, I've run out of staples. Right, will you go along the bottom and cut the bottom off as well, please, Jen? Jen's finished the vapour barrier, so what we're going to do now, we're going to start plasterboarding. You will need to plasterboard your ceiling before you before your walls. Um, right, I'll just explain something to you. Right, we leave a 400 spacing in between joists. The reason why it's 400 is because it's more economical with the Kingspan. Um, 
it just works out better that way for us. Kingspan's, not Kingspan, in fact, Ecofirm, whatever you want to use, it's really expensive at the moment and it doesn't look like it's ever going to drop. So we use 400 spacers to get a full sheet output base, which then means you have to cut your plasterboard because otherwise your plasterboard would fall on the joist if it was 400 centers. And I fully appreciate that, but for the size of the rooms we're doing, it's not the end of the world. So what I've done, I've measured down. My measurement is 2,260 to the center of there, but what I don't want, um, I don't, right. If you have a look over here, Jen, there's a, paper, there's a paper finish on that plasterboard. Obviously that's strong. That end on there is the end of the plasterboard. There's no paper finish, but it's still stronger than cutting it because it's been machine compressed. So what I don't want, I don't want two hand cuts there because it just isn't as strong. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna cut the board and put the cut to this side. And then when we put the wall on, it will then trap the cut in there. And then on this joist here, we will have two machine end cuts butted together, which are then screwed, which will be stronger than two hand cuts. In my mind, that's just my opinion. Um, I just don't like to see it. Um, and we've never had a cracked ceiling or anything yet. So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna cut this board to 2260. I'm gonna put the cut over there. Me and Jen are gonna hold it up. We'll put the camera down and I'll show you how difficult it is to plaster pot a ceiling when you haven't got any props and there's just two of us. Okay. Jim showed me which knife to buy. Told me I should uh, fill, fill my Stanley box. There we are, look, nice and, well, it was nice and full. And then every time Liam needs a new blade, Right, so you cut in plasterboards. The plasterboard kills the blade quite quickly. So, I mean, they're cheap, aren't they? Buy some and just keep changing them. Right, I measured 2,220, which is actually that line, not that line. My finger scribe didn't work out the way it should have done. Yeah? So what I'm going to do now, uh, for those of you that don't know, if you just score the boards like that, I'm not putting loads... I don't know if Jen can see how far that blade has gone in. Do you want to have a look there and see? Can you actually see how far the blade is in the plasterboard? Yeah. Right, so you don't want to like try and force it all the way in. All we're trying to do is break the paper and slightly break the plasterboard. And what will happen then, again, because it's going to, well, it doesn't have to be the greatest cut. If Jen just goes around there now, what will happen then, if you go behind it and just give it a little tap with your knee, it will break on the line. Do you want to come? And then again, I'm just going to get the knife and I'm just going to score down the back of it. And that's the easiest way to cut a plasterboard. Or you can use a handsaw if you want. Um, more work, more, more dust, dust, more dust. Right, so that's this plasterboard. What I've done, I've marked where the roof timbers are, because obviously when we put this board up, we're not going to be able to see them timbers anymore. So I've pre-marked them where they are. We're going to use 38 mil jip rock screws, possibly 32. I can't remember what we've got in this box here now. 38 mil plasterboard screws. Um, they're not a jip rock brand, actually. They're actually just from Tool Station. Didn't see me spit on the screen then. <laughs> but um, th they'll do the job. And also what you need is, I never remember, a PH2 bit. There you go, can you see that? Yep. That's the bit for the jib prop screws. That's what's in there, lovely. Jim showed me which knife to buy. Told me I should uh, fill, fill my Stanley box. There we are, look, nice and, well, it was nice and full. And then every time Liam needs a new blade, <laughs> Right, so you cut in plasterboards, the plasterboard kills the blade quite quickly, so I mean, they're cheap, aren't they? Buy some and just keep changing them. Right, I've measured 2,220, which is actually that line, not that line. My finger scribe didn't work out the way it should have done. Yeah? So what I'm going to do now, uh, for those of you that don't know, if you just score the boards like that, I'm not putting loads, I don't know if Jen can see how far that blade has gone in. Do you want to have a look there and see? Can you actually see how far the blade is in the plasterboard? Yeah. Right, so you don't want to like try and force it all the way in. All we're trying to do is break the paper and slightly break the plasterboard. And what will happen then, again, because it's going to, well, it doesn't have to be the greatest cut. If Jen just goes around there now, what will happen then, if you go behind it and just give it a little tap with your knee, it will break on the line. Do you want to come? And then again, I'm just going to get the knife and I'm just going to score down the back of it. And that's the easiest way to cut a plasterboard. Or you can use a handsaw if you want. Um, more work, more, more dust, dust, more dust. Right, so that's this plasterboard. What I've done, I've marked where the roof timbers are, because obviously when we put this board up, we're not going to be able to see them timbers anymore. So I've pre-marked them where they are. We're going to use 38 mil jip rock screws, possibly 32. I can't remember what we've got in this box here now. 38 mil plasterboard screws. Um, they're not a jip rock brand, actually. They're actually just from Tool Station. 
I didn't see me spit on the screen then. <laughs> but um, th they'll do the job. And also, what you need is... I never remember. A PH2 bit. There you go. Can you see that? Yeah. That's the bit for the Jiprox screws. That's it's in there, lovely. Um, can you just tell them the difference between a... Can I what? Tell them the difference between positive... A PH2 and a PZ2. Right, so the difference between a PH2 and a PZ2 is I can't ever remember. As soon as Adam comes back, I will get him to do it that's because he a, knows. That's got, that doesn't have the bits on. Where's the, other, where's the other bit? Do you want to explain it? No, I just want to explain it. I don't know how the two. Right, so I don't know how to take right, so that one there, one, look. This one, mm -hmm. right, that's got the little. The crossy bit in it. Crossy bits. But what does it mean? Why is that one? Can you see how pointy that one is? Yeah, and that's not got the little bits on. Do you know what I mean? I know what you mean, but why? Know why? The terminology. Adam this is why does. We need Adam. Yeah, <laughs> come back, Adam. <laughs> come back. Right. So when Adam comes back, um, I, I obviously, if you've watched my videos, you know I don't know the terminology for anything. I use, often use the wrong words. But when Adam comes back, he's very serious, and he will tell you exactly what the difference is between PH two and PZ two. A board is 25 kilos. This has probably just lost a kilo that we've cut off there. So we're still looking at 23, 4 kilos, aren't we? Yeah? What? A kilo? No. <laughs> I don't weigh a kilo. Right, hold on. Right, Jen is disputing the fact that this is possibly a kilo. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go get my pencil out. Oh, Jen, explain to them what these are called and where you get them from. Um, I can't remember. Right. <laughs> you tell us. They're from Tool Station. Other retailers sell them. Um, they're called a, a tracer pencil. And basically, they were, I refused to have one at first because I didn't believe in them. Um, but they're really good. And as long as you keep the little, the little holdy thing for it trapped somewhere, then you're good because you cannot put it behind your ear. Well, you can if you've got big ears. Oh, but well, the only thing is... There you go, look. Jen likes to keep it in her mouth and then it's going to break her teeth. Yeah. Like, like that. that. Yeah. It. And it whacks it up, doesn't it? So I'll just show you them there. Look, they've got like, remember them old school pencils at school and you just press it and your lead keeps popping out and then you hold it in and it pops back in as well. Oh yeah, they've got a really teeny little pencil sharpener on them as well, which is brilliant. There, see, works. Um, what were they, about 20 quid or something like that? Uh, yeah. Right, back to the weight of this off-cut of plasterboard. I reckon a kilo. Okay. Yeah, you reckon what? Right, 25 kilos in a board. So you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 and a half. Right, divide 16 and a half by 25, 25 by 16 and a half. Right, obviously our maths isn't that great, so oh. we'll get a calculator out. Jen's going to actually be proved wrong in a minute I now. Am, yeah. She thought she was right, but her maths was crap. So what did we say? 25... Divided by 16.5. Divided by 16.5 equals 1.51 kilos. So that piece of plasterboard there is 1.51 kilos. So when I says we've now got 23, possibly 24, I was practically bang on, wasn't I, Jen? Right, every day is a school day. I've just schooled her. Okay, right, now this is where it could all. Did you not put to? It's pushed up enough. It's pushed up enough. Right, so. What we're going to do, we're going to lift the board up. I've got some screws in my pocket. Um, um, Jen's going to hold it. And once I've got a few screws in, I'll explain as to why we need to get them in. All right. So what we're going to do, we're going to throw this 23 and a half kilo board up, aren't we, Jen? Yeah, yeah. We're going to rotate it. We're going to push it to the back wall. And then we're going to slide it that way. Are you to the back wall there, Jen? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Good? Uh -huh. Right. So... What I'm going to do now is get some jip rock screws in and I'll explain in a minute how far they need to go in and how many you need to put in to hold up this board. Jenna's got a grip of it there. You good? Mm -hmm. So you can see where I've put the black marks. That's it, you can let go of that. Right, so that's got one, two, three, four, five screws in it. Five little jip rock screws. Um, they're positioned in and they're only sunk. Just um, That's how far you want to put the screw in. Just to compress the paper 
This is from Jan. Yep, that's enough. It's enough. It's in. It's pushed in. It's compressed the paper. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to imagine a line there. Um, so I can see where that line is down there. I'm going to go down it, fixing every 250 to 300. And then that will suffice for that rafter and you need to do down, that down every single rafter. And then what we're going to do, we're going to cut a piece to go in there and then the off cut from there will go over there. You want to stagger your joints as much as you can, basically. Uh, right, what Jen's doing now, she's screwing every 250 to 300. Let's... There, that's gone in perfect depth that right now. It's below the paper, it's just compressed it. Um, that's what we want all the way down. So, okay, Adam, what would you like to explain? Well, it's not me they'd like to explain. You would like me to explain okay. to the... I don't know to the who wants to know. I think it's you two that want to know, to no, be honest. Well, yeah, me and Jen obviously want to know what the difference is between PZ2 and PH2. We're going to explain the difference between PH2 and PZ2. PH2 we use for drywall screws, which are... Like so. Okay. PZ2, which we use for all other screws, if they're not torque screws, are a Phillips cross with an extra cross. Ooh. That's PZ2. That is the difference. Right, can we have a look at the bits to see this cross on there? You can. So that's PZ2. Minute, minute, minute. Yep. PZ2, so you've got your cross with yep. a cross internal. PH2. One minute, one minute. One minute, don't move it. There we go. PH2, just across. Right. And there you go. Thank you for that explanation. No problem. What are you doing? I didn't want to. <laughs> so, I explained earlier when we did first fix lighting, I and mean, we still are first fix, but I showed you where I cut out and put me like my wires for my lights. So, I did all my measurements and everything, and I drew them. I drew them so I wouldn't forget, just on here. Yep. So I've got 700 square for my first light, and 1560 is my middle light from either wall, because that's in between. So, so we'll measure, no we won't, because I have got a pencil in there. They ain't measuring from this side. So, we'll put our 700 mark on the plastic there. 700 on there. Stanley Fat Max chalk line. Then we're going to measure along our chalk line, our first light. He's written on the wall, 700. So for the next one is 1560. And if I measure from the other side, 700. That's where our lights are going to be. What are you using to the hole with that? So this is a Makita combi drill and a 70 mil hole saw. Why have you got a 70 mil hole cam? Well, the 70mm is suffice for the um, spotlights. And centre it on our line. And try and find our wire. About the crowd. So that's the, the square that we cut out when we were insulating earlier. That's that's suffice for um, for our spotlight to go in. Preparation, preparation, preparation. As if by magic. Happy with that? Yep. And then. Will we do the last one, Liam? Yeah. Liam and select the last 
this is why we give ourselves a hundred mil square all the way around, because if Liam or anybody doesn't insulate it properly, then we've got a bit of leeway. Okay, I just want to address one little matter before we finish for a Friday. Um, Egg of Protect, that's what we normally use on the floor. There's a short of it, shortage of it in the country. We used Egg Appeal, Easy Peel, I think it was called. A few of you said, oh my God, you should have covered that floor. It's going to be ruined, it's rained. It did, it peeled it down for four days constantly. Um, this is the floor today. It's obviously peeled it back. There's no damage to it whatsoever, so... Um, if you can't get egg to protect, don't worry about it. As long as you can get your roof on within a week, I wouldn't even contemplate worrying about it. The floor's bone dry. There's no ridges on it where you would expect the water has gone down the joints and, and um, blown it. It's absolutely fine. Solid construction. Thank you. Right, we plasterboarded the ceiling. Adam's cut out for his lights. Um, he didn't have to ping a line on this one. Fortunately, the joint in the board has fallen straight on the centre of the lights and the room is perfectly square, so that's worked out fine. Our side walls are tapered, therefore we're putting a tapered cut to the roof. Um, what I've done there, you can see I've marked where the uprights are. Um, marked where the uprights are. So in fact, you've got two choices there. You can either draw a pencil line or you can use a la laser like that. Or you can freehand it like, you know, if, if you want to do it that way. There's two ways of doing it. So there's your vapour barrier. There's your plasterboard. Adam will go around there and he'll, he'll laser a line at 300 watt. You Adam and call your back boxes off. You can see over there, that's where the parrises are. They're now concealed behind the wall. So when that is plastered and the bracket goes on there, we know we've got full fixing behind that wall anywhere we choose. Um, we use jib rock screws, 38 mil, I've showed you them. We also use this plasterboard lifter. What happens with that? It goes under the board. You just give it a push up like that, it pushes the board tight to the ceiling then and then you can screw it. What we generally do is leave a 20 mil gap under the floor, under the plasterboard at the floor and the reason for that being is when we laminate the floor you want a 10 mil expansion gap around the perimeter of the building but because it's an outdoor building as well and we're just trying to preempt the floor expanding more than what we normally do then we leave a 10 mil gap for where it hit the wall plus it's got another 12 and a half mil to slide under the plasterboard as well so you've got actually 22 and a half mil for that floor to expand or you've got nearly two inch over the full room which is it's never going to happen that's absolutely fine so plasterboard screws approximately every 250 apart um a full row across the top as well a full row across the bottom loads of screws loads of fixings do it right it ain't ever going to crack on you these walls will not crack. Um, we, don't, we don't ever go back to cracks because we screw it right, we fix it right, um, and it's built on a solid foundation as well. So that is it practically for the day now. That's it, Friday, another week over. Um, we're gonna finish plasterboarding this. Adam will drop his back boxes in and then we'll be off. If you'd like to like, subscribe, follow, comment, and all the rest of that malarkey, that would be fantastic. Um, and I'll try and answer as many questions as I can, okay? So it's goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha.